Bob has given before to, to this group. Uh, it's also the one that I feel worst about myself when <laughs> we're done. Uh, and so you can eat your lunch, enjoy it while you can, right? And uh, listen carefully to uh, what he has to say. Because it's very sober. But thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Peter, for inviting me. Uh, actually, this is not the same talk that I've oh. given in this uh, before. Uh, I specifically talk with Peter about this. Normally, I give the science talk because, after all, this is CTSI. But he said, no, he wants a little bit of a different spin because, after all, the whole idea of CTSI is to translate. And how better, you know, normally that's translation of basic science to clinical medicine. But what we're going to do today is translate clinical medicine to policy. Okay, so a slightly different translation. So we're going to take it up a notch and explain how a molecule can cause a global health disaster. How's that? That's as policy, you know, that's as a translational as it gets. Okay, from a molecule to global health disaster. We're going to go there today. Uh, first of all, I have no disclosures. I promise you no food industry is putting me up to this. <laughs> and uh, this talk is the exact same talk that I gave yesterday in front of the Congress in Mexico, in Mexico City. Let's go back to last night at midnight. Uh, they are uh, debating a soda tax on Sunday. Or they're uh, voting on a soda tax. And if they pass it, they will be the first country to institute one. And so this is a big deal, and the food industry is, has poured, poured billions of dollars into the it. And right now it's very neck and neck, so they asked me to come to try to sway the tide. I'm just curious, sorry to interrupt, but do they have any ideas so far as to how they're going to funnel that tax? Is, is it going to yes. be specific? To no, there's going to be, a, the main thing they're going to do is try to use the tax to develop potable water throughout the country so that there's an alternative, which is exactly what's needed. If you ever been to Mexico, uh, you know, if you live to tell the tale. <laughs> okay. So here's the problem. In 2011, two years ago, the UN General Assembly, Ban Ki-moon, Secretary General, announced that non-communicable disease, that is, cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, is now a bigger threat to the developing world, not the developed world, the developing world, than is acute infectious disease, and that includes HIV. That is a huge paradigm shift, and it also means a huge shift in resources. So the question, of course, is how do you deal with non-communicable disease? So they plan to target tobacco, well that makes sense, alcohol, well, that makes sense, and diet. Well, what about diet? What are they going to do? Gonna Eat less total calories? Is that the, the target? You know, we've been doing that for the last 30 years with absolutely no effect. If anything, things have gotten way worse. And you know the set, you know, the old definition of insanity, right? Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Or are they going to target fat? Well, they've been doing that for 30 years too, and again with the exact same response. Red meat, people at Harvard School of Public Health think red meat's a problem for various reasons which we won't go into today. Dairy. Anybody here read the China study? What'd you think? Piece of crap. <laughs> and there's a reason it's a piece of crap. It's 500 pages of univariate regression analyses. Univariate. Okay. If you're going to do diet, you can't do univariate. You have to do multivariate. Because if one thing goes up, that means something else is going down. How do you know it was the thing that went up that was the problem? Maybe it was the thing that went down that was the problem. How would you know? You can't. And you have to put everything into the model to figure it out. They don't model, as uh, Esselstyn and Caldwell. Piece of crap. <clears throat> okay? Get rid of it. Okay? Circular file, for now. Okay? Now, if they do the right stats and still come up with the same answer, then we'll talk. Carbohydrate, you know, lot, yeah, refined carbohydrate, big deal here in the United States. Are any of these the real problem? I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to let Will Smith know. <laughs> well, I guess I'll use some answers also. What would you call a chatty all of a sudden? Sorry, I can't talk right now. I got some secret cases of my own I'm working on. I hate to turn you away from the video game. 
Alright, I'm hanging up. You know the most destructive force in the universe? Sugar? <laughs> <laughs> you know, if Hollywood knows this, why don't you? <laughs> so, here's the problem. It's all on this slide. This is the this is the problem. This is Coca-Cola's coming together ad released this year. They were going to release it during the Super Bowl, but there was a huge clamor from the medical community and they deep sixed it for the Super Bowl, but it's still available and people still watch it. And it says, beating obesity will take action by all of us based on one simple common sense fact. All calories count, no matter where they come from, including Coca-Cola and everything else with calories. So what they're saying is, you can get your calories from carrots, you can get your calories from cheesecake, you can get your calories from Coca-Cola or anything else with a C. It doesn't matter. A calorie is a calorie. If you eat more than you burn, you will gain weight. If you eat less than you burn, you will lose weight. And it's not our fault because you can get your calories from anywhere. And of course, there's also exercise. So this is a great way for the food industry to provide cover and subterfuge for what it is that they are actually doing. Well, that's based on common sense. Well, I don't believe in common sense. I believe in data. And the data say something completely different. What the data say is that some calories cause disease more than others because different calories are metabolized differently because a calorie is not a calorie. Anybody see just this week on October 10th in Nature, there was an article from Lou Cantley, who is the head of cancer research at Cornell. He's with Beth Israel in Boston. Okay? And the title of the article is F is for fat and fructose. Okay? So here's a cancer researcher who knows that a calorie is not a calorie. So everybody knows that this is addictive and hazardous to your health. No argument there. We all understand that, right? And we regulate alcohol too, addictive and hazardous to your health. We regulate that. What about this? What do you think? So. All the data I'm going to show you and all the information that I'm going to show you are in these two uh, uh, articles. One, a popular article from the New York Times Magazine, maybe some of you saw two years ago, called Is Sugar Toxic Written by Gary Taubes? And this was our comment in Nature called The Toxic Truth About Sugar, which I wrote with my colleagues at the Institute for Health Policy Studies, IHPS, right over here at Law Heights, uh, Laura Schmidt programs. Now, the public health community has made a decision on what it takes for a substance to be regulatable. What it takes for something to have to undergo societal intervention. You have to satisfy these four criteria to be considered for societal intervention. Unavoidability or ubiquity, can't get rid of it. Toxicity, abuse, and finally what we call externalities, that is negative impact on society. How does your use affect me? So when your bad behavior affects me, that's a problem. When your bad behavior affects you, go kill yourself. But when it affects me, that's a problem. And that requires regulation. Everybody with me? So let's start with unavoidability. All right, we're all eating more, I agree. We're all eating more. Adult men are eating 187 calories more than 25 years ago. Adult females, 335 calories more. And here, teen boys, 275 calories more than 25 years ago. We're all eating more. I don't argue that. And of course, the food industry can say, well, QED, end of discussion, that's the obesity epidemic, we're all eating more. And indeed, that's what our government says, that's what the Institute of Medicine says, that's what the NIH says, that's what everyone says. We're all eating more. Yeah, we are. What are we eating more of? Is it fat? Nope, not fat. Five grams, 45 calories of those 275. In fact, if you look at the secular trends in specific food intake, here are the fats. Whole milk, way down, because we're all told to go low fat. Meat and cheese up very slightly, milk desserts up. Bottom line, it's a wash, and that's what the data show. It's a wash. We are not eating more fat. We are not eating less fat. We are eating the same fat as we always did. Nothing's changed. But as a percent of our total calories were fat, because the denominator changed, okay? So the numerator you know, didn't change, but the denominator did, so the percent went down. Look at our obesity prevalence went through the roof. Because it ain't the fat, it never was. What is it? What's the carbohydrate? That's what's gone up. So 57 grams, 228 calories, and it's refined carbohydrate. 
here are all the carbohydrates on that same secular trend, and they're all through the roof, indeed, because that's what's been subsidized. And specifically on carbohydrate products, right? 41% increase in soft drinks, 35% increase in fruit drinks, fruit aids. That's what we're consuming more of. So I pulled this slide very specifically the Coca-Cola conspiracy. Why? Well, okay, so here's the original bottle, standardized bottle out of Atlanta in 1915, 16 ounces. And if you drank one of those every day for a year, that would be worth eight pounds of fat per year. <clears throat> By 1955, with the advent, you know, with the uh, uh, stoppage of uh, uh, food restrictions from uh, uh, World War II, right, we stopped rationing. Okay, we got the 10-ounce bottle, which was the first one found in vending machines. Then the ever ubiquitous 12-ounce can in 1960, which was 16 pounds of fat per year. And currently, of course, today this is the single unit measure. Anybody know how many servings are in that bottle, that 20-ounce bottle? 2.5 8-ounce servings. Anybody know anybody who gets 2.5 8-ounce servings out of the bottle? That's a single serving. Okay, that's a single serving. So that would be worth 26 pounds of fat per year. And over here we have the 7-Eleven, uh, uh, Big Gulp, Thirst Buster, Kmart, whatever you want to call it. 24 ounces, that's worth 57 pounds of fat per year. And my colleague, Dr. Dan Hale at the University of Texas San Antonio, tells me that down there they got a Texas-sized Big Gulp. 60 ounces of Coca-Cola, Snickers bar, and bag of Doritos, all for 99 cents. So you would say, QED, there's your obesity epidemic, right? Not so fast. Why do I call it the Coca-Cola conspiracy? Well, what's in Coke? Caffeine. So what's caffeine? It's a diuretic. It makes you pee free water. What else is it code? Sodium. 55 milligrams per can. Where is there sodium code? It doesn't need to be. Anybody who's heard of thirst? oil crown coal? It's long gone. No sodium. Okay. But they got decimated by coke, perhaps. Okay. What would happen if you take on sodium and lose free water? Get thirsty. You get thirsty. Thirstier, right? So why is there so much sugar in the To hide the salt. It gets played on your tongue. When was the last time you went to a Chinese restaurant and had sweet and sour pork? That's half soy sauce. You'd never eat that. But with the sugar, you can't even talk. They know. So they do this very specifically to get you to drink more. So it is the Coca-Cola conspiracy. So what is this stuff called? America is this stuff called high fructose corn syrup, the most demonized food additive known to man. We're up to 63 pounds per person here in America. But the current users are only US, Canada, Japan, and very limited exposure in parts of Europe. The rest of the world has sucrose. They have the same problems we do. They're a little further behind, but you know they have the same problems we do. They get all the same diseases we do, and this is an obesity epidemic everywhere, and they don't have high So what are we talking about? So here's one molecule of glucose, six membrane, one molecule of fructose, five membrane. Glucose is not very interesting. Anybody ever had a glucose tolerance test? Tastes good? It's, a, it's disgusting. Yes. It's gross, right? Mm -hmm. You don't see people going around chugging k syrup, do you? That's glucose. It's good enough for pie, but that's about it. Okay. Fructose, on the other hand, this stuff over here, we love this. We will go out of our way for this. Okay. This is the thing. This is the straw that stirs the drink. This is what we care about. Now, high fructose corn syrup is either 42 or 55 percent fructose, mostly 55. But here's sucrose, table sugar, cane sugar, the white stuff. You know, put stuff you put in coffee. One glucose, one fructose. O-glycosidic linkage, the enzyme sucrase in your intestine, cleaves us in about a nanosecond. You absorb both moieties. Basically, it's a wash. They're the same. And all of the studies that pit HFCS against sucrose in terms of metabolic effects show no metabolic difference between the two. And I agree. No difference. They're equivalent. They're equivalently bad. Equivalently toxic, and I will demonstrate the toxicity of the Now, 
People talk about our increase in insurance consumption, which of course has occurred. More recently, you'll notice there's been a slight decline in the last couple of years. But we are still way over where we used to be. Here's going back 200 years, 200 years now. We've increased our insurance consumption by 1,000%. And so here are the different phases of U.S. sugar consumption. Here's the growth of the sugar industry with, you know, C&H and, you know, the bayou and, you know, growing in Louisiana and stuff. And we got up to a stabilization here just before World War II where we saw a decline for, because of rationing. Okay, and then it came back up again. And then high fructose corn syrup hit our shores and that launched this new wave here at the end. Everybody with me? So we're not just consuming a little bit more, we're consuming a whole lot more, okay? Up to 120 pounds per year right now. Now, the American Heart <coughs> Association has weighed in, and they say that this is the threshold where sugar causes cardiovascular disease. If you believe the tobacco alcohol, uh, not tobacco, sorry, the fructose alcohol analogy, which we proffer, based on how they're metabolized equivalently, how they reach the mitochondria the same and cause the same metabolic diseases. This is the threshold for alcohol, and therefore it probably is a rational equivalent, equivalent threshold for fructose causing disease as well. Okay? But that's a theoretical one. Okay? The question is, do these thresholds actually make sense in terms of the disease we've been seeing? Well, here's when cardiovascular disease started rearing its up. We had 1931 Paul Dudley White, the head of cardiology at Mass General, also Eisenhower's mm -hmm. personal physician, said that cardiovascular disease was rising ra more rapidly than factors should allow. 1931. But that's when we did that plateau. And then the second big kahuna was 1988, because that's when adolescent type 2 diabetes as well. and that was all way up with the high fructose corn syrup. Now, this proves nothing. This is temporal association. Who cares? Doesn't mean anything. Okay? But it's interesting. Just keep it in the back of your mind. Now, this is what's going on on the world stage. Here's world sugar per capita supply. And here's what the American Heart Association says we should be at 100 to 200 calories per day of added sugar per day. So this is the white blue. Okay. You'll notice the entire world is higher than that. And that's the point. And that's why every country in the world is now experiencing chronic metabolic disease in increasing rates. But again, that's just correlation, not causation. We have to get to causation. Now, if you want to understand what's happened, you have to sort of go back those 200 years to the beginning of the sugar <coughs> pandemic. And this, anybody see this article in National Geographic? It was from two months ago. Okay. The food industry had a friggin' cow. How dare you put sugar on the front cover of National Geographic? You know, where's, you know, the Zulu with the painted face? You know, no, you gotta put a cupcake on it instead, right? It's pretty funny. <laughs> but if you want to know about what happened in the first 150 years, read this article. It's very good. Okay. But let's talk about the last 50 years. So this is the perfect storm that has come from five political winds that have basically swirled all at the same time and has created tsunami that is basically overwhelmed us. So here's what's happened. First, the fall of Batista in Cuba, because that was our sugar fix before 1959. Now, you know, Cuba, we, we don't trade with anymore. And so we needed a new sugar fix, and that started the Florida sugar growing and that's why the Everglades are being decimated to this day. Okay? And there's a whole group save the Everglades, and it's all about getting sugar out of Florida Everglades. So that, that started that. Number two, 1973. Richard Nixon, as you know, was quite paranoid. And he believed, rightly so, that fluctuating food prices caused political unrest. And we had a lot of political unrest back in 1973 in this country. Maybe some of you weren't born yet, okay? but I remember it quite well. Quite a bit of political unrest. And so he told his agriculture secretary, Earl Rusty Butts Levin, that food should be taken off the table as a presidential election 
concern. Well, a way to do that is to make food cheap. Make food cheap. That was Nixon's uh, remanding of what's make food cheap. So this is from Time Magazine two years ago called Hungry World. And what it is is a map of the world, and it shows the percent of GDP spent on food country by country. You'll notice here's the U.S. at 7%, U.K. at 9%, Australia at 11%, and we have the lowest percent GDP spent on food. Therefore, we can afford more iPods, iPads, and we are the three fattest nations in the world. So is it because the food's cheap or is it because we have more iPads? You can't tell. Okay? But what's interesting is, look at the countries in purple. They're all at 36% of GDP or greater, and every one of them has had a revolution in the last two years. <clears throat> Indeed, Nixon was right. Fluctuating food prices caused political unrest. I'm sure we have more. <clears throat> Number three on the list, the advent of high fructose corn syrup, invented in uh, Japan, Saga Medical School by Tamasaki in 1966, and introduced to the American market in 1975. Initially, the food industry was quite skittish about using it because they didn't understand it. It was sweeter, and they didn't know what to do with that. So it didn't start actually entering the food supply until a little bit later, but it provided competition for sugar. And so what you see here is the U.S. producer price index. Now, what you need to know is that for political stability and for economic stability, you want to stay at 100%. 100% okay? means no change in prices. Look what was happening in the early 70s. Up, down, up, down, fluctuating, sugar prices all over the place. Not good if you're trying to achieve political stability, right? So here's the advent of corn sweeteners here in the yellow. And look, everything stabilizes out, right, at 100%. It works because there's competition. The sugar industry had to lower their prices. And remember, sugar prices were always artificially inflated in this country and still are because of the sugar tariff which is the second oldest piece of legislation on the books in the United States, dating to 1790. We've always had artificially inflated sugar prices here because it was to foment and help grow an American sugar industry. Because if you were getting it from other countries, why would you need one? Everybody got it? So we were paying extra anyway, but now we had a real competition, and it was homegrown competition. And look, this changed the price elsewhere. So here's the US price going down as corn sweeteners entered. And look, it even stabilized the London price for sugar, and they didn't even have high fructose corn syrup. Because there was less of a demand for sugar, so there was more for England, therefore prices stabilized. Economics, supply and demand. And look, here's the US retail price for sugar against HFCS, half the price. So what happened? If it's half the price, you can afford to put in more. And so we started seeing sugar being put in foods that never had sugar before, like bread, like yogurt, like barbecue sauce, like ketchup, like salad dressing. You get the picture? And now there's uh, sugar in virtually every processed food. Of the 600,000 food items in the American food supply, 80% are spiked with added sugar because they can afford to do so. And they know that when they add it, you buy more. We'll talk about that when we talk about abuse. So here's what happened. Here's high fructose corn syrup entering the market. And you'll notice sugar went down. This, is come, this came from the corn refiners themselves. They said, hey, it's just been a substitution. We substituted something cheap for something expensive. That's good for the economy. That's good for the consumer. Not exactly. Because there's 73 pounds per year, and here's 95 pounds per year. And there's something missing from this slide. Anybody know what it is? We're talking about sugar consumption. Something missing. It's called juice. Juice is sucrose, right? When you take the fiber away, there's actually more sugar in juice than there is in soda. So let's add juice in. Here's most fructose items. In fact, that's where you get the 120 pounds per year from. Okay? So 120 pounds per year of added sugar per day for every man, woman, and child in America. That's six and a half ounces of sugar per day on average. So the question is, is that okay? Can you deal with it? Can you ever handle it? 
Number four. This is the big one. We were all told to go low fat. 1977, the McGovern Commission told us we ate too much fat. We needed to go low fat. Now, why did we say that? What, what were the data that, that supported that? Well, in the early 1970s, we discovered LDL. Brown and Goldstein won the Nobel Prize for discovering LDL and the LDL receptor. In the mid-1970s, dietary fat was shown to raise your LDL. So if dietary fat is A and LDL is B, we learned that A led to B, and that's still true today. Dietary fat does raise your LDL. I don't argue that. In the late 1970s, we learned that LDL levels in large populations correlated with cardiovascular disease. So let's call cardiovascular disease C. So we learned that B correlates with C, which is true in large populations, not for individual patients, but for large populations. That is true, too. So the logic went, well, if A leads to B and B correlates with C, then A must lead to C. Therefore, no A, no C. Get rid of the dietary fat. LDL levels will drop, and cardiovascular disease will go away. That was the logic. Anybody see anything wrong with that logic? Yes, no. First of all, A could lead to B could lead to D, E, F, G, H, and I never come back to C. Number two, any logicians in the room? The contrapositive of an argument is not no A, no C, is no C, no A. So this doesn't even make sense on logical grounds, never mind scientific or empiric grounds. But nonetheless, this is what we did. We changed the food supply based on the McGovern Commission, who based it on this thesis. Now let's talk about where that thesis came from. In the 1970s, there was a big fight between nutritional factions, the sugar people and the fat people. Okay? The sugar people were led by a British physiologist and nutritionist by the name of John Yudkin. And in 1972, he published this book called Pure White and Deadly, where he basically laid out the case that sugar was responsible for the cardiovascular disease, particularly the heart disease that we were seeing, just like White had seen in 1931. On the other side, we had Ansel Keys. Anybody heard of him? He was on Time Magazine. Anybody heard of the K ration? You know, anybody know what K ration is? K ration is a little box that has 12,000 calories in it that World War II soldiers carried into battle in case they were stuck behind the enemy lines. He was the inventor of the K-ration. That's why it was called K-ration, Keys ration. So he was kind of famous already in America. Okay. And he was the one that said saturated fat was the cause of cardiovascular disease. So these two fought it out, and it was a very rancorous fight to move. Okay. With a lot of actual name calling in the literature. It's really quite disgusting if you read it. It's really awful. Well, let's talk about what Keyes said. So here's his seven country study. US, Canada, Australia, England, and Wales, which he considered two countries, don't ask me why. Italy and Japan. And here's the percent calories from fat, and here's coronary disease rate. Looks pretty good. Looks like a real correlation, doesn't it? What do you think? Except for one little problem. It wasn't the seven country study. It was the 22 country study. He cherry picked the seven. And here are all 22. Now, there still seems like there's a little bit of a correlation, but not nearly as tight as there was before, right? And he left out some countries. He left out the outliers. They're over here. The Maasai, the Inuit, the Ili, the Tokelau, the indigenous tribes, they eat only fat. <laughs> they eat whale blubber. <laughs> they drink blood. Okay? They don't have any carbohydrate. Okay? They eat only fat. And they have the lowest heart disease on the planet. So why didn't he include those? So let's actually examine what Keyes said. Let's, so this is actually from page 262 of the seven country study. Xeroxed right out of the book. The fact that the incidence rate of coronary heart disease was significantly correlated with the average percentage of calories from sucrose, sugar, in the diet is explained by the intercorrelation of sucrose with saturated fat. Sucrose correlates with saturated fat. 